everyone, and welcome to you all. And this is our first citizen science event of the year, myself and Liz, and the community of practice. So we're delighted to see so many people in the room. And thanks a million for all the people who joined online as well. So we have Neen Froach with us today from Pat Conversation Ireland and Emma Teeling. So Neve is the project manager at Bath Conservation Ireland. And one of the projects that she's involved in is the car-based bat monitoring scheme, which tracks trends in three species with the help of volunteers across Ireland. She was co-author of Irish Bats in the 21st Century and the recent Field Guide to Irish Bats. Emma, um, who we're delighted to have here today, is full professor of zoology and um, is an international leader in the cross-cutting fields of mammalian phylogenetics and comparative genomics, with particular expertise in bat biology. She established the Laboratory of Molecular Evolution and Mammalian Phylogenetics in 2005. That's also known as the more user-friendly Bat Lab. Emma received a prestigious uh, European Research Council Synergy Grant to explore how bats defy the aging process and was highly commended at the Irish Research Council Researcher of the Year Award in December 2023. And we're going to begin with Neve. Off you go, Neve. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Thanks for having me. And, and the clicker here. Great. Okay, we'll we see how this all goes. So much technology. I don't think I can cope. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to introduce the project, um, the couple of strands that were involved in it. And Emma will be taking over for the techno technical aspects, which I had very little involvement in. Um, so just to take you through what we did. Um, so, yeah. First, do we have to have that? Oh. So if I lift this up, can I lift the bar up, do you know? Is there a way to get rid of that bar there is? And you do more and you do hide? Just check. Hide. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great, thanks. We did it. <laughs> so yeah, myself and Emma, I suppose, have had various discussions over the years about trying to get some work done on ecosystem services and bats in Ireland. Um, and... Uh, have looked into various funding streams um, and actually the Community Foundation for Ireland announced a funding stream um, in December 2020 which we applied for um, and were successful with um, and it was a partnership between ourselves UCD and also with the National, Biodiver the National Biodiversity Data Centre in Waterford. Um, so it was called, uh, the long name for it was Identifying Irish Bats and Their Prey um, and had two aims. The first was actually to develop and publish a comprehensive identification guide for Irish bats uh, with the assistance and expertise of the NBDC in Waterford. Uh, and in true uh, forgetful style, and after forgetting to bring a copy of it to show you today, you can get it very easily on uh, the NBDC shop. It's only $7.50. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't have an actual physical shop uh, copy to show you today. Um, so the second aim of our project was to work towards identifying an invertebrate prey that is being consumed by Irish bats, um, but via a citizen science project. Uh, and this was done, obviously, in collaboration with ourselves and UCD. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background in case any of you aren't familiar with bats and um, don't know much about them, um, they're in the order Chiroptera. There are well over 1,400 species, I think I'm counting. Um, they are the only mammals that undergo true powered flight. Um, so they're not like flying squirrels, which fall with style. They actually can undergo true powered flight. Um, let me just... Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if I have to, have I to click on this again? Yeah, let's get, we're trying to get rid of that again. Yeah. Let's see. So it's more, and it's loading me. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that the next time. Great. So yeah, so just to explain, uh, chiroptera actually means hand wing, um, and if you look at a bat's wing, it's actually really like a human's human hand. So their arm is. You know, you can see their shoulder there and the what's in the circle is actually the bat's elbow um, a bat's. Then the next circle shows you a bat's wrist 
um, and they have five digits just like us. Uh, the first two digits, the thumbs are small, they're little claws. Um, and then the, the, the second to fifth digits are elongated. So the first two form the leading edge of the wing membrane. Then the second two, as you can see, are longer. The fourth and fifth digits are very long as well. And then the skin stretched out between them. So the skin between the uh, first and second, and sorry, the second and third and the fourth digits and also between the fourth and fifth digits. But then a large part of the wing membrane is actually uh, between the fifth digit and the whole body of the bat. So it's like if you had a big pile of skin between your little finger and your body. Um, and then there's also some uh, membrane, a tail membrane between the tail and the legs of the bat. So that's basically how they can undergo this true powered flight um, with this big, large uh, wing membrane. And they are important in their environment. Obviously, there are 1,400 species. They're all eating different things. And a large proportion of them are insectivorous. Um, and there's more and more research coming out about the sort of, I suppose, the function that they play in our environment in terms of our agricultural environment. So here we have a uh, new work that's been carried out on apple orchards um, and the, the discovery that bats are keeping pests away from those. Um, but also then in you know sort of a, a wider global context, Context where you have uh, fruit eating bats, they, they're in, involved in the role of seed dispersal and um, you have uh, pollinating bats as well. Um, and then there's been recent reviews looking into exactly what the sort of ecosystem services are that bats uh, can and do provide across the across the planet. Um, so um, in terms of their life cycle in Ireland, um, our bats are born, uh, 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 the, sorry, the females gather in a nursery or maternity roost. So uh, a roost is what you call a place where a bat lives. Um, and so the females gather in nursery roosts um, in sort of spring. And then in the early summer, they give birth to a single pup, uh, which, and then they lactate and feed the, their baby with their own milk. And then the young are usually able to fly after about sort of seven weeks or thereabouts, and they're able to go out and catch their own insects. In Ireland, bat, our bats are insectivorous. We don't have any fruit eating bats or pollinating bats. They're all insectivorous. Um, so then towards the end of the summer, mating occurs. So it can have, depends on the species, but some species, it might be the male set up a lek or a kind of a, uh, a harem and they attract the females to it and mating occurs there. In some species, they all travel to a swarming site. Often these are in caves uh, and that's where mating occurs. And in Ireland, um, our bats then hibernate for the winter because, of course, they don't have enough insects to eat to keep them uh, going through the winter, the cold winter months. So hibernation is the life strategy that they use to survive the winter months with very little to uh, consume. And then the other interesting aspect that, of course, Emma's looked into a lot is longevity. So bats are very long lived, particularly in, you know, compared to their size. Um, so the oldest bat that I think we know about is one. It was a brand it was considered to be a brand bat. I think they call it a Siberian myotis bat now, but it was first ringed uh, back in the 70s, was it? And it has been refound since, and it was 41 years old at last count. Um, in Ireland, we don't know how long our bats live here. We're assuming they're also long lived, maybe not quite that long. We're kind of assumed that our little pipistrelles might live about sort of seven or eight years um, on average. Um, so just out of interest, if anybody's involved in education, particularly with children, we have a lovely website called learnaboutbats.com, and that's what these illustrations were made for. Um, so if anybody's ever involved in work with schools or teachers um, who are in, in, you know, involved in STEM education, learnaboutbats.com is a nice resource. So in Ireland, we have nine resident bat species. Um, they... Eight of them fall into one family called the Vespertilionidae. And basically they're, well, we shorten it to Vesper bats, but basically Vesper bats have an uncomplicated muzzle. So if you look at their muzzle, it looks like a kind of a, you know, dog, mouse, you know, very simple kind of not, not there's not a lot going on in terms of weird facial structures. So eight, eight of our bat species are in that family, the Vesper bat family. And three of those are in a genus called Pipistrellus. So these are our Pipistrelle bats. This is one of them here. There are three species in it, and that includes two of our most common bat species, the common and soprano pipistrelle. These are really tiny little guys with their wings folded up. They fit into a small matchbox. They only weigh about five grams. Then we have three species in a genus called myotis. 
uh, there's whiskered natterers and uh, dobenton spats. Again, they have this uncomplicated muzzle, as you can see. And then we have two other two other species that are also in the vesper bats: brown long-eared bats and leisler's bats. Brown long-eared bats, as you can imagine, have very long ears. The ears are about the same length as their bodies. Leisler's bats are our largest bat species, uh, but that's not very big. I mean, they only weigh on average about 12 grams, so they're still small animals. And this one here is a slightly different species. It's in a different genus. It's called the lesser horseshoe bat. Um, and this bat has a very unusual structure around its nose. It's called a nose leaf. Um, and I haven't mentioned echolocation already, but you're probably all aware that our bats echolocate to find their food and avoid obstacles. But this bat actually makes its focuses its sounds through its nostrils instead of echolocating through its mouth. Um, and that's probably the reason why it has this unusual um, setup. So how to tell them apart? So apart from the lesser horseshoe bat, you probably saw that they all look pretty similar. And so there's always this difficulty for bat workers and people who are dealing with bats trying to identify them to species level. And until now, we had no identification guide for the species in Ireland. There has been a lovely DVD produced um, about uh, the bats of Ireland. But as you can imagine, that it is difficult to get that into the field. Um, so Irish bat workers tend to rely on publications that were produced in Britain or in mainland Europe which does add complexity and confusion to the situation because we have nine species. In Britain, they have at least 16. I think there's probably more now, I'm not too sure, but they keep adding to it. So they've got more species that are you know, fairly similar. It kind of makes the whole thing a lot more confused. So we wanted to have a, a guide to the bats that we find in Ireland so that would reduce confusion uh, and that could be easily carried out into the field. Um, and the National Bi Biodiversity Data Centre has been producing a whole series of field guides for a whole range of different species and species groups in Ireland. Um, for everything from bees to ladybirds to shield bugs, grasses, trees, the whole lot. And so we asked them if we were to produce the text and the content, would they be able to publish it under their series? So that was what we decided to do. So our field guide includes our nine confirmed resident bat species, but also two Vagrants are two species that have been found at least once in Ireland. Um, you know, it's possible there are more of them. Um, so it's the identification guide to Irish bats. Um, and it contains information about the morphology of the different species, those important features that you need to use to distinguish them in the hand. So it's got a lot of different detailed illustrations and diagrams to help people identify bats in the hand. It also has descriptions of where you might find the different species, the habitats, their distributions, uh, the flight styles, that kind of stuff. Um, and that just shows you actually the lesser horseshoe bat up close. So uh, the pointer is this one, isn't it? I don't know if it works, is it? No, use the mouse. So that's the nose leaf of the, of the lesser horseshoe bat here. You can see its eyes just about in this and these are its ears. Um, so anyway, it shows you the key identifying features for the different species. But also we wanted to bear in mind that a lot of people, when they're going out and they're interested in bats in Ireland, they're not necessarily finding bats in the hand. They're actually going out with bat detectors, which are little instruments that pick up the echolocation calls and convert them into either a sound you can hear or a picture, a pictograph, if you like, a sonogram of the sounds that the bats are making. Um, so we wanted to include information about the echolocation calls. So there's a page on, each, on the guide for each of the species, describing it in words, what the sound is like, but also then pictures. And then if that's not enough, we also have QR code on there. So you can scan that in on your phone. It leads you to a page that's hosted by the, the Biodiversity, uh, the MBDC, Biodiversity Ireland. And you can scroll through that to check through. You can either download WAV files and look at them on your um, on your so uh, on software on your phone or your device, um, or you can listen to it. If you're using a tunable bat detector, you can listen to the sounds. And for those of you who haven't heard a bat on a bat detector, no, wrong side. This is what it would sound like. No, it's not working. Soprano pipistrel at 55 kilohertz. And it was working. <laughs> Don't know, maybe online they can hear Soprano it. Soprano pipistrel at 60 kilohertz. 
Soprano so goes to well at 55 kilohertz. Um, I don't think I don't think people in this room are going to be around here. Soprano at 60 kilohertz. Oh, oh well, there we go. There we go. Great. Thanks. So if you have a tunable bat detector and you're listening to a pipistrelle bat, this is the kind of sound that you'll hear as the bat is flying past. Hey, I'll just get to this again. High floating meeting controls. No. Yeah, so that was published in December 2021. So that was the first strand of our project. And then getting on to the piece that you're probably all mostly interested here, the bats and bugs part. So this element involved ourselves and UCD working together. Um, so we wanted to ask roost owners, people who have bats maybe in an attic or in an outbuilding, uh, to basically go and collect bat droppings, to send them back to yourselves in UCD and then ca uh, carry out DNA metabarcode analysis. And this would tell us what bat species were present in the roost um, and also what they were eating. Um, so citizen science is an important vehicle for democratizing science and promoting the goal of universal and equitable access to scientific data and information. So actually in Bat Conservation Ireland, we've been working with citizen scientists since 2004. Um, what usually happens is we provide training and equipment and it's usually in relation to a specific survey that we are carrying out. Um, and people go out into the field with bat detectors and they count bats in particular situations. Um, and so we've had volunteers, probably thousands at this point, who have helped us through the years to carry out surveys along rivers for Daw Benton's bat, which is a bat that flies across uh, the water and picks up insects with its big feet. Uh, we've also had people who go out year after year driving known routes and detecting bats. And from that, we track trends in a number of different bat species. And also people going out a couple of times a year at known brown long-eared bat roosts and counting the number of bats that come out of the buildings. Um, and from that, we're tracking trends in the populations of brown long-eared bats. So we have a long track record of working with citizen scientists. We know that people can gather really, really uh, solid data, um, and provided they're provide, you know, given the good training and they're provided with the equipment to do that, and they're really keen to do that. So that's somebody carrying out a Dal Benton's uh, bat survey. Um, and from this data, we've been able to collect really good, important information on annual trends in these species. They're all protected under the Wildlife Act and under the ha EU Habitats Directive. And just an example of some of the data that we've picked up from the, uh, the driven transects. Um, this is a Leisler's bat trend that we've, uh, it goes up to 2021, but at the moment it's still increasing as far as we can tell. This is Soprano pipistrels, one of our most common species. Uh, also increasing, common pipistrels also increasing, and Nathusius pipistrel is an interesting one because it was only found in Ireland in the mid 1990s, and it seems to be expanding its range across North Northern Europe because of climate change. And as far as we can tell, the error bars are not shown in this graph, but they're very big for this species because it's still rare in Ireland. But as far as we can tell, it seems to be on the increase. And then uh, this is something we're very concerned about. We think our myotis bat species perhaps not Daw Benton's bat, but our other two species, which forage a lot in woodlands, may actually be on the, the decline. Um, so this is the kind of data that our volunteers uh, you know, record for us um, once we've carried out the analysis and done the stats on it. Um, and we, you know, we have had a wide variety of people who are involved in our citizen science surveys, everything from professional ecologists to people who are retired and want to try something new, people who are involved in tidy towns, sometimes people who are actual wildlife rangers so and sometimes students as well who are interested in you know getting a bit of hands-on field experience so they find volunteering in the summer on something like this to be really useful to them um, so for the bats and bugs our first task was to design a website uh, this was a key tool in recruiting volunteers to the survey and we wanted to provide really clear information about how to do this survey and we wanted to really encourage people to help through that tool through the website um, it also had some back end functionality so that in UCD, the researchers could input data and then we could get automated emails sent out to our volunteers when different stages of the project were completed. And this was the recruitment tool. This is where people signed up uh, to become citizen scientists. 
uh, and I just recorded. This is just gives you an idea of what the front page like. So there are a lot of calls to action on it. You know, in red, the buttons register here. We've got some nice pictures of bats as well. We wanted to make sure that it looked attractive to people. We're aware that sometimes bats can have a pretty negative uh, connotation for some people and they're like bats but this is the cutest bat you could possibly see yes. so I mean why wouldn't you want to help um, but also then very clear information about what we're trying to find out how you can help uh, what you need to do you just register here you know what is a citizen scientist you know what's you know what would you be you'd be becoming a citizen scientist if you were involved in this project uh, so, you know, very simple, three steps. You just register, you get your sample pack, you do the sampling, you send it to UCD. Very simple. Um, so just going back up. Taking too long, I'm going to die. It's going too fast. So just in terms of instructions, there's a sampling protocol. Again, we wanted to make sure that this was really clear, really simple. Um, so we provided a PDF of it. We also recorded a narrated version for YouTube um, and it was only five minutes long. So people, it just took five minutes of people's time to check, can I do this? Um, rather than, you know, having to go through a big, long instructional, you know, manual that would take a long time and, um, you know, wouldn't be of interest to them. So also then in terms of registering, they just click on the register button and a page came up. Obviously it's closed now, but it was again, very simple registration page where you just gave your, your address and details um, and the packs you want and we sent it out. So the sampling packs again, uh, Emma's one here. So very simple. It was just a pack with, uh, there was prepaid postage because we didn't want anybody to be out of pocket. We didn't want posting it back to be a barrier to participation. So we provided the postage, paid with postage for the return of the sample. It had stuff for health and safety, masks, gloves, tweezers, um, the Eppendorf tubes, which is the all important uh, piece of equipment to make sure that the sample returned in one piece and safely. And then some paperwork, which was the instruction form, sampling form, and also um, a piece of paper on a safe protocol, protocol for work, you know, to make sure that people were thinking about the risk they were taking that they weren't going to go into some kind of an outbuilding that was had lots of rotten timbers or do something stupid because that's the very last thing you want to happen on any of your citizen science surveys for someone to um uh, get injured. And also on this address here, it's the Gwinnell Herpy who's sitting here in the PhD who's talking about the lone researcher uh, who collected all of these and let's say it took lots and lots of time. There are over yes. five thousand of these built. Yes, she did a great job on that. With Little silica beads in there that basically, you know, in a handbag, you find those little things that takes all the moisture out. So when you put your droplets in here, it takes out all the moisture to preserve the DNA. So everybody have a look. So in terms of actually, uh, you know, how we, you know, designed this leaflet, there was a lot of thought put into this because, you know, often when you provide people with a lot of text, they just won't read it. So we wanted these pictographic uh, kind of descriptions of how the thing was done. Uh, so people would, you know, do it correctly, basically. So we did a lot of work with the designer to sort of illustrate how this works. Um, you know, this kind of thing, wait 48 hours, you put your used, used uh, health and safety stuff into the bin, you put your newspapers down. Um, and then, you know, keeping your mask and gloves on when you're using the tweezers to put your droppings into the tube and then you post it off. So that kind of thing, which was important. There was also a narrated version on YouTube. Now, we didn't have any in-person or online training, which was quite, kind of different to a lot of our other surveys where we would have, you know, we would talk to people in person or maybe on Zoom and explain how it works and people could ask us questions. So this was quite a hands-off one. So again, this underlined the importance of making sure that the instructions were really clear. We also had to mention and underline actually the need to minimize disturbance to bats in the roost. We do have a we did have a license to do this and we also had to review all the information um run it all past a health and safety consultant so that we weren't getting anybody into any difficulty or trouble and ensure that we had coverage under our insurance policy as well, which is also important for any citizen science um uh schemes so once we had everything up and running 
uh, we launched it with a press release and online Zoom event. It was picked up by a lot of me media outlets. Um, the mention of the word bat poop seemed to be really attractive to the media outlets. We had a good interview with Claire Byrne, which I think was very good for kicking it off. Um, and so we had a lot of headlines like this. Irish researchers asked public to bring them bat poop or poop scoop job. So once you can mention poo, it's, uh, it gets you lots of headlines, which is good. Um, um, in 2021, we rec recruited 121, 121 volunteers, another additional 156 in 2022. Um, and many pe people actually requested a couple of or more than one sampling pack. But in fairness, most of them actually only returned one. So 119 samples were returned to UCD. The overall return rate was actually very high, I think, 43%. Uh, so we were very pleased with that. Um, and the website worked really well for managing volunteers' data and results. And people got a lot of information out of the, the stuff that they'd sent, really nice information about the species that they recorded, that obviously Emma will work with, uh, explain more about. And we also developed a final an animation to illustrate the project that we'll show you at the end. So, Emma. Okay. Well. Sorry for... I've got my one. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let's see if this work. Okay, so we've got everything in place. You've got a website, you've got the samples, you have the ideas. And just to kind of overview and remind ourselves, so what people had to do, they had to sign up and register. Uh, we prepared all these kits, thousands and thousands of samples, all these kits were sent out. The people had to go up into their attic. So you need to know that you had bats in your attic, that you had poop in your attic, put down a newspaper, collect the poop put them in tubes into those, put them into those little silica tubes, send them back to us. But they also had to fill in the form. And in the form, they had to say, okay, what type of bat do you think you have? Do you have a pipistrelle? Do you have a myotis bat? Maybe you have a horseshoe bat. Probably shouldn't go into those rooms, but people had to fill all this in. And they'd fill in a whole lot of data about what they thought they had in their attic. And they were, had to return our sample. So what did our samples look like? Look how lucky we were. See all those little teeny tiny things? That's bat poop. And so what we were asking the question was, all right, we wanted to ask what were these bats feeding on? Are they feeding on really the pest species of Ireland? Those nasty biting insects that will pass on infection to us and to our livestock. Were they feeding on insects that were going to be eating all of our crops, passing on disease? Were, were they going to somehow mitigate the damage that arthropods could cause? What were the ecosystem services? But that's what we had to deal with. So how do you work out from a bat poop that's the size sometimes nearly of a full stop? What's in it? Well, years ago, there's a, an American, what is it, a dime or is that a quarter? I don't know. Something very small. So that's the size of a bat poop. So what typically people used to do is they take the dropping, which is very, very dry. They put it into water, sift it all out. I know Neve's PhD involved a lot of this. And you look down the microscope for bits of insects that haven't been digested properly. And you look for diagnostic characters, which are veins on wings or hairy bits on legs. And that's how you can identify what has that bat eaten. And what's the problem with that? Is the actual, actual sheer exhaustion. I tried to make this as an animation that saw this young scientist aging, trying to do her PhD over 30 years to be able to identify what's in these droppings. It's really, really hard. It's nearly impossible. And also you miss lots of things. But thankfully we're now in the new era of DNA sequencing. And meta barcoding was a technique that we optimized when I was sitting here in, in my lab. So what you do, so you take the dropping, get in those Eppendorf tubes, and you extract the DNA. So the genetic code that's in that poop. Now remember, what's in the poop? On the outside of the poop are going to be the mammal cells. As the poop goes down the digestive tract, the cells are on it. But also there will be the DNA from the remaining insects. Even more interesting, you can also look at the plants, maybe the insects were eating and the fungus. So you can look at a whole ecosystem from poop if you do it right. So we design a method to extract this DNA. We then, what we want to do with what you see, the way you were able to identify the species from the DNA and that eat each one of us in all of life in your mitochondria, which is a, an organelle in your cell, in its DNA, there's a part that's unique to each species. It's called a barcode. 
So it's like when you scan anything in a supermarket, there's a unique barcode, it's a human, it's a dog, it's a bat, it's a particular type of mosquito. And so we developed these methods whereby you're able to amplify a copy of that barcode, of all the barcodes that are in that droppings. We use phylogenetics as a methodology to be able to see what's different and what's the same to identify what species is this. Now we're lucky if we already have the barcodes in the database of all these different species, but sometimes not all the barcodes are there. So you find new ones. So you can also identify new species and use some of this evolutionary um, tree making methods from my lab to identify where they might be. The other cool thing about this, you have to pool all the libraries. So you're able to take five droppings. So five droppings per roots were all put together. The DNA was extracted. You pool them all. And we use this new sequencing technology. And look at that. See this little tiny thing? This is a min ion. This is this new, new DNA sequencer that you can carry all around the field. You can do X, Y, Z, and it's relatively cheap. You know, they're thousands of euro rather than hundreds of thousands of euros, which is they are. So that meant that we could speed things up. And they'll do this huge, massive parallel sequencing for relatively cheap. And we decided we're going to try and use this new method. So do you want to pass it all around? That's a DNA sequencer right there in your hand. And we're going to use this new technology um, so that we could do, we wanted to look at lots and lots of samples we're going to get from our citizen scientists and amplify and sequence them quickly and as cheaply as we could. Now the catch is, not all new technologies are perfect. So we were going to have to find different ways to do this. So let me see if I can, uh, can I move this guy over here for a minute? So this goes to show you the concept of these barcodes. So again, we were going to midline sequencing, look for this particular barcode of life and be able to assign it to all species. We could work out which bat species they were. Were the people actually right? What were those arthropods they're feeding on? What could we find? Pretty cool. Now, the difference between all of this, when you do it with citizen scientists or with uh, just one person, is here's Gwen. Gwen's PhD project is to travel all over Ireland by herself and with the, and sample at loose everywhere, but you are limited in the amount of places you can sample. You are limited by the sheer exhaustion of having to do hundreds of nights, months long nights going out and catching. And Gwen here, she is doing all this work herself and focusing on particular routes. Well, with the citizen science approach, we can expand this. So the lone researchers are developing all the technologies, but we need to bring us all together to work at what's going on in our own ecosystems. We were so lucky by these samples that were collected, 2021 and 2022. 119 samples were received and they were in good condition. And that back end, that database that people took the time to fill in, gave us lots and lots of information. 119 samples received, 25 counties, luck, Munster's winning. Cork, Tipperary, Kerry, Clare, Waterford and Limerick had 50% of the samples. Now ask yourselves why, why is this? Were there more bat researchers involved in there? Are they more interested or more biased? What's going on? So we need to redo this and you know make a competition with the other counties mm -hmm. and see can we get more. But the one thing that's interesting is that we were able to survey right across the whole of Ireland. Now, this is this Corrine land cover. It's a different type of habitats and each different color is a different type. And due to the citizen scientists being able to collect in different places, we were able to look at the biodiversity of bats and what they feed on in multiple different habitat types. So that was a big, big win. And again, just to remind ourselves, bats eat the insects, they poop out the insect bits. We do this whole entire amplification of the barcode. We sequence them all and we work out what, what, what's what. And we pulled everything together. And you gotta be really careful with this because it's a very powerful, PCR is a very powerful thing. You can amplify things that aren't actually there. You gotta be very, very careful. So we had to work out how many citizen poops could we put together? How do we make sure we're getting the right answer? So it took a lot of time and optimization by Gwinnell and by James in the lab. And also we were optimizing the use of this new DNA sequencer, this MinEye. I see Netan down there. She also helped us optimize making the, the DNA, this MinEye work. So Netan and Jens does a lot of this meta barcoding. Just to show you the pain of working in our lab, there's James. Oh, he's very happy. I should have made him work harder. <laughs> so he's loading the samples right now. And again, using these kind of multi-pipette channels, loading onto the benign, 
sitting there and having a nice cup of tea and the mind does all the work. So what do we find? So overall, we pulled everything together. We've got about a million of these reads, this DNA, big, long DNA sequences. We had to filter them and do X, Y, and Z and have lots of different thresholds. When we cleaned up the data, we found that by 25% of our reads were actually, it's bat DNA. So we could identify the different bats. And 75% were the arthropods or the bugs. So what you can see here, so don't worry about all what, 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 what this means right now, because it's very noisy. But up there, each one of these little lines is actually from a roost, from a collection from a citizen scientist. So five poos put together from one roost. And what you see in the color are the different types of bats. And if you look at this, you see the most predominant color here is yellow. So these are the Sopana pipistrels. And you'll see in one roost here, you've got black and you've got green. So the whiskered bat and the pipistrel. And what we found is that when we finally put everything all together, we found seven different bat species were identified in these roosts. The pipistrel, Sopana pipistrel, little wee one, is the most common species because I think it likes to roost in our houses. That's probably why. 51 of the citizen science samples we found pipistrels, but we found 23 mixed roosts. So these bats are actually two species are hanging out together in one. But this was a really, really cool finding. So this was in Garnish Island in Kerry. The volunteers thought that this was a pipistrel roost. And what we found here in red is that actually it's a lesser horseshoe bat roost, very protected. That bat that's roots with its arms round to itself when it's sleeping and it has that very interesting nose leaf, but it was actually a lesser horseshoe bat root. So this is very, very important for Europe and for Ireland, found by citizen scientists. Um, we also found that there were these mixed roots, 23 of them, but Neve talked about these myotas looking like they're going to climb. We also found these whiskered bats, these new myotas bat roots in Cork. So it's a way for us to be able to easily survey our mammalian biodiversity rather than going out with the bat detector, catching the bats in the net, spending endless hours, lots of information and poop. So again, we're finding these really important species that are potentially going to decline. And now we will know that these are the new roofs that we need to protect to maintain them. What about the bugs, the arthropods? So again, what you hear each one of these different lines is the uh, bug data from each citizen scientist. And in color, the different types of groups, RNA, the spiders, which I really dislike, uh, but this kind of greeny color, a diptera, which are the flies. But just as you look here, I mean, what jumps out at you is that there's a predominance of one particular type. There's lots of those kind of like green, these diptera. So the, these are the true flies. So the bats are feeding on these. So 92% of the arthropods identified were these true flies. There's lots of them. We also found these Lepidoptera, or the moths. And they're the second most common that's found, common arthropod found in 44% of the sample sites. So they're eating moths. Moths come out at night, the bats eat them. We know that. We also found Ephemoptera and Trichoptera, the mayflies and the caddisflies. And they appeared around 25% of the sample sites. So this is quite interesting. So we we're finding all of these. But overall, this was our distribution. So we can see here, there's pictures of the bugs. So you have the RNA, the spiders, you've got these true flies here. And you have chapula, which are these crane flies, these major pests. But you can see from this, that we get this huge range of different arthropods that the bats are feeding on. Now, this big, huge fellow here, this guy there, as you can see him up here, this is a moth fly. And this is the highest abundance that we found. So we were kind of going, all right, is this real or is this not? So we're looking into this because it's very, very predominant. So sometimes what can happen when you're doing meta barcode and get this overabundance of a single read for some reason. So we have to go back and then double check that. Uh, I know now that Gwen is finding a different way of looking at this, the same thing. So it probably is real. But we reanalyzed, we took that out to see, do we get a difference in distribution when we remove potential noise? And you don't really. You see there's spiders, beetles, earwigs, true flies, they're eating lots of them, mayflies, true bugs, wood lights, moths, lacewings. They're eating all of these things. So that's pretty cool. It works.
What's also interesting is that we can actually then now go look at each of the different roofs and see at that time of year the samples collected, what's the most important prey? What are they feeding on? And we found roofs, for example, that had mixed roofs, whiskers and brown long ears. We found these pipistrels that, that were sharing roofs with, again, more brown long ears. So again, we're finding a bit about the ecology of our bats. And we can work out then what type of food do each of these species eat? For example, here's your whiskered bat, many Trochoptera, Lepidoptera and Diptera. There will be our most common, which is the soprano pipistrel. And you see there's more Diptera and more Ephemoptera. So they're different. So different bat species are feeding on different things. But what does it mean? So we were able to use a citizen science approach to really do this right. And there's major monitoring implications. So there was this horrible study done, I, I was all over the press, uh, where there had been a study in the decrease in arthropods in a wonderful protected forest in Germany after a 20-year study. And there was an 80% decrease in arthropod biomass. So if you guys remember, I don't know, maybe you're all a bit too young, but driving out in the country and you'd, everything would be splattered all over your windscreen. You drive in the country now in the summer and there just aren't the arthropods there. We are losing our biodiversity so, so quickly. And we need to be able to maintain our ecosystem. So all of the bugs and the bats, they were required for our ecosystems to work for us to be able to survive. But this is a way of monitoring because the bats feed on these arthropods so they can act as a biomonitor. But what did we find? We found 119 new bat roofs for BCI to help study. We found this new arthropod range of biodiversity in Ireland. We found new species that people didn't know about. There was this old paper, there's 19,000 animals in Ireland, but I reckon there's a hell of a lot more. So we found this new Southern house mosquito, which is a really nasty carrier of West Nile virus. You don't want that here, but it's here. We found these gall midges, crane flies, this new species of winter fly. We found a parasite wasp, which is new to Ireland. We found this thoughtful um, apnea, a moth. So there were just some of the things that we were able to find by, by doing this. But also we can look at these bat poop monitoring as bioindicators of the health of our ecosystems. So arthropods are useful to monitor overall environmental health. So typically think about water quality. So if it's good water quality, you get a lot of these Trichoptera and Ephemoptera, mayflies and caddisflies. Uh, bad water quality, you get lots of midges at the Corona day. And if you look right now at our water system, things are changing. You've got 40% of our water system quality is good, some is okay and poor. But this is just an example of how it works. And so these were roofs that were near certain uh, bodies of water. One that's in Leitrim, and you can see here, it's moderate quality water. But right here, you found three species of these coronamids, these non-biting midges. Again, the bats are feeding on things that indicate it's poor water quality. Whereas in Kerry, you could see there was three species of mayflies, a good indicator. So rather than having to go catch all these things, you just do take a poop, do this quick now method of looking at what's in it, and you can get really good assessment of the quality of the environment the bats are living in. So we can do this to look at this environmental response to change. So any changing farming practices, we can see what happens because it's the arthropods are gonna initially respond. The bats are feeding on them. Look at the poop, see what the change is. What they do in South Africa is they're able to look at the arrival of these pests by monitoring bat poop more so than by going out and catching all of these pests. It's actually much faster to be able to see. You can see the signal much quicker doing this amount of barcoding. So we can look at what happens to our environment by monitoring bats, but also long-term. We need to look at whether or not our arthropod biodiversity is increasing or decreasing. What's going on with our wildlife? We need a baseline to be able to assess, okay, right now in 2024, how many species of bats we are? How abundant are they? Are they changing? Are they not? So that we can actually do something about it. And this is a quick way of doing it. But we need to have everybody involved. We need our systems involved. So 42% of our citizen samples had potential pest species in them. So bats are helping us with our pests. 
And we found 20% of these arthropods are these potential pests. And here's a whole list of them. And um, the main potential pest species are these crane flies or tapula. You have a marsh crane fly, a European crane fly, you've got this house midge, house mosquito, should I say, and a blue tongue biting midge. The bats are feeding on all of these. And these crane flies are major agricultural pests. And right now the um, insecticide that we were used to use against them is banned because it's really bad. So they're increasing in number. We need to have the bats to feed on them so that we don't go, uh, so that our crops aren't hugely threatened. We found lots of them. But really, so we have our citizen science. We need more. We need more. We're working right now to understand a bit more about the ecology of these bats. We're trying to look at these overall interactions. Gwenelle is looking at how things are changing in a temporal time and how things change in different landscapes. And we got to really promote conservation of our bats and our environments. It's very, very important. And we need to bring more, without the citizens, we can't do this. There's another thing that we need to do. We need to look all over the whole Ireland, not just Munster. We also need a reference database. We need money. Okay, <laughs> show me the money. Because for all of this to happen, you know, it's man hours, it's people hours, it's women hours, it's children, it's every hours, it's dog hours. It's it's It takes a huge amount of time and dedication to do this. So we've got the tools right now, we've got it all set up. But we're nothing without the, without the citizens to collect these samples. But I think, and it doesn't cost so much money, like in relation to going to the moon or something. You put up satellites, why can't we do this? So none of this could happen without the brilliant, brilliant people in my group. So it was James, Gwinnell, Elsa was involved in all of this. Neve and Tina collected everything. Of course, all of our citizen scientists and all of the other group people who are sitting around here in my group. But then Neve is going to talk to you a little bit about the cool narration that we made. Oh, yeah, that's um, this. <laughs> This is just a shameless plug. We've developed a new platform on Back Conservation Ireland uh, to start uh, provide online training. And so there's actually um, some free resources there if anybody's interested in finding out and learning more about Irish bats. Uh, the first two um, modules are entirely free. Uh, and it's the first one is about um, learning about Irish bats. The second one is um, echolocation of Irish bats and identifying them using tunable bat detectors. So anybody is welcome to register and go through those um, training.